Thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm Suzanne Martinez from Advocate Aurora Health. I work in the service areas of Good Shepherd, Condell, and Sherman. And thank you so much uh, for just participating in today's program. It's absolutely important. And I actually think it's intriguing uh, from the first session, and we're just gonna uh, give a brief overview of the first session because we did get feedback from that. Um, but not to worry, I will be available on uh, YouTube so you'll be able to view it. But also, um, it is a good launching point for this particular topic as well, but it's complete unto itself so you won't be lost in any way, shape, or form. Um, I myself found it intriguing uh, just to learn about a world that I didn't know a lot about, or so I thought. Uh, but being uh, an avid uh, communicator and participator in the community, I realized that I might have touched on areas that I didn't even realize just by attending fundraisers and auctions and other activities. So I'm not going to give away or steal your thunder, Elizabeth, as you start to unfold this program for us. But I have to say that I'm absolutely thrilled to be um, just partnering with NICASA. It's just been an awesome experience. Your knowledge, um, just the way that you're able to support the community to bring such a, an amazing topic to our attention as well. Um, I'm really grateful that you're here. And, I just want you to be able to get started. Tell us about yourself first and foremost, and then please, um, we'll launch the program and I will adhere as to I'm telling my other uh, participants here, I will stop my video and place myself on mute. So welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. All right, so as uh, Suzanne mentioned, this is a, a series brought to you in partnership between Advocate Aurora Health and NICASA Behavioral Health Services. And you can see this is the second in our current series, Gambling and Health, um, including gambling during COVID because it's very timely and it is uh, affecting our community. Um, and our next topic is going to be safer sports betting, what you need to know, and that will include a conversation about athletes and their unique risk for developing gambling problems. And then in November, think teens, don't gamble, think again. And depending on the response and the interest and other topics that are related that the community reaches out to us for, we may end up extending this series. So please know that as we mentioned, we, we are recording. We will pause the recording anytime that somebody has a question or a comment um, that comes up in the chat box and that way people can feel free to participate. But we'll share this on, online, probably on YouTube so that we can really get this information out to the people who were interested but weren't able to make it work for their schedules. And I really want to introduce um, one, myself, my name is Elizabeth Thielen, I'm with NICASA Behavioral Health Services. I'm a licensed and professional counselor, a problem and compulsive gambling counselor. Um, and I am the former president of the Illinois Council on Problem Gambling. I also am an adjunct faculty teaching process addictions at the College of Lake County. Um, I work for NACASA Behavioral Health Services. I've been here for about 19 years. We've been in Lake County since 1966, providing a variety of behavioral health and social services. And I really do want to acknowledge that we have a lot of support that allows us to do these kinds of workshops and, and the work that we do, including the um, Illinois Department of Human Services, United Way, uh, Lake County Community Development. I really need to do a big shout out because in the work that I do, including statewide regarding uh, problem gambling prevention and advocacy, Lake County is the only county that I'm aware of that actually funds very um, robustly problem gambling prevention programs as well as different social services that help um, mitigate some of the harm done by uh, by gambling in our community. So that's really rare and very unique and it's really worthy of note. Uh, as a matter of fact, we also have a number of volunteers and other partnering agencies that really just collaborate because no one agency can do it all. Uh, so I'm very grateful for that. NICASA and myself are neutral on the subject of adult state-sanctioned uh, gambling. Um, there's a little asterisk there next to neutrality, which means we are not neutral on the subject of problem gambling. We're not neutral on the social costs that can come with uh, gambling. And so we will be talking about some of those topics today. And with any workshop where we talk about ways that uh, ourselves and our community can be impacted, it's important to remember that we're people too. Okay, so we're talking about an interesting topic 
We're hoping that we'll learn and we'll share information, but we can be impacted by what we hear. And so if you are moved by something and it hits close to home in some way, um, please do what you need to do to take care of yourself and always feel free to reach out offline um, to me or one of the other people in our program. Um, and uh, we have contact information later in the presentation for that purpose. Um, as mentioned, we are, well, we're using Zoom, so you can use the chat feature of Zoom to communicate with me and to Suzanne, and we'll pause the recording so we can be very candid in our discussions, um, and we'll share this recording. And you can see at the top of your screen, there's an opportunity to go to a website and put in a code to interact with the presentation, but that gets just a little tricky, so we're just going to use the chat function, and you can ignore that at the top of your screen. Any conversation about gambling, we need to make sure we're all on the same page. What are we talking about? Because we would probably all have different definitions if we wrote them down and compared them. For the purposes of today, we're going to talk about risking money or something of value on an event for which the outcome is unknown in the hopes of winning more money or something of value. Now that something of value is important, especially when we do our workshop later on um, about teens, because teens often do bet stuff rather than money, though they do bet money sometimes too. Um, but just keep in mind this definition as we proceed. Um, and if you think about what are some examples of gambling, I'm going to launch a quick poll and see if we have anybody um, on, on the uh, Zoom meeting that is willing to mark down which of the uh, games that you see listed do you think constitutes gambling with our definition that we have there. Um, and just looking at that right now, I don't see anybody voting and now we're seeing some voting and I am going to share those results with you. And you can see that the people who um, have answered are really saying that all of these games are uh, gambling. And so Suzanne, please do let me know if that um, image is still up on the sheet on the screen because it's not on mine, but I know in the past I've left it up somehow. Uh, so please let me know. But otherwise, you can see we have uh, from a former presentation where our participants actually typed in their answers different types of games that they believe meet that definition. Slot machines, bingo, casino, sports betting, the scratch lottery tickets and instant lottery tickets, roulette, blackjack, horse racing, craps. So a lot of different um, types of gambling that are available around us in our community. With that um, question, I am going to launch another quick poll. And let's see, um, that's the wrong poll. Here we go. Question, is the stock market gambling, yes or no? I want you to think about the definition that we had. And again, it looks like as far as our answers that our participants believe that that is gambling. And so I will um, share that most workshops that we do, we get most people saying, yes, the stock market is gambling, and sometimes we have some no's, and it's okay for people to have um, the belief that stock market is not gambling, um, and it's often because they're not going by the strict definition. Very often, any of us who have a retirement account, we participate in the stock market to some degree, whether it's very actively or very passively, I'll admit, like I do, just you fill out this form and you don't think about it. Um, and uh, so there is this feeling that, well, I do it and I don't gamble, so it's not gambling. Um, and then there are also people who believe that because there can be some skill involved um, in trading, that it's not gambling. And just remember that our definition does not uh, distinguish whether or not it's a game of skill or 100% game of chance, because there are some games that are gambling that do incorporate a degree of skill they are still gambling. Okay, so moving on to our next slide, we do want to distinguish what we are not talking about when we're just talking about gambling. It's not necessarily playing cards or games for no stakes. And I'm going to give you an example that I may have given before, but I love it. Um, my stepson is 12 years old, and one of these days he's going to do one of these workshops with me because he really wants to. Uh, but he knows so much about responsible gambling, problem gambling, and he's aware that uh, when we, when I pull out that little bingo 
um, wheel where the bingo balls come out and we're going to play. He goes, but we're not playing for money um, because he knows that for young people, for, for young brains, that gambling is not healthy. And so, yes, we can play bingo. We can play cards, not for stakes. And for us, that is not, does not constitute gambling. And then gambling is not necessarily bad. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we don't believe that gambling is in and of itself good or bad. We do know that for some people it can cause problems, that there can be unintended consequences in communities where there is gambling. And then gambling is not the same thing as problem gambling. And so uh, hopefully, depending on time later on, we'll make sure that everybody's really clear on what gambling is and what problem gambling is so that we can distinguish that. Another, um, this is not gonna be a poll, I just want you to think about this. How many spots do you think that there are in Illinois to place a bet legally? And I will tell you, if you think about that, I am guessing, not betting, <laughs> I'm guessing that you are thinking around 43,000 or maybe 80,000. And the answer is that you're, you're correct. And most participants choose one of those and everybody's right because it's a trick question. Uh, because prior to January 1st of this year, there were approximately 43,000 locations to place a bet in Illinois. And with the expansion bill that went into effect January 1st, that opened the door for additional establishments and locations and uh, up to about 80,000 places where you could make a bet legally in Illinois. And we know that if we just kind of look around us, look around our community, there's lots of opportunities to gamble. There's um, a casino that is nearby, though not in Lake County, though there is a casino that is in the planning stages to be placed in Waukegan. They, uh, Waukegan was the recipient of one of the new gambling licenses with that January 1st expansion bill that I mentioned. Um, we know that there's video slots in poker, there's horse racing, there's off-track betting right here in Lake County, there's sports betting, um, bingo halls, and so we know that it's kind of all around us. And if we, I was at one training and they said, where's the closest place to gamble? And we had people saying, oh, well, there's that casino and there's that casino. And I thought I was like a smarty pants. And I said, well, just down the corner, there's lottery at the, um, at the gas station. And then the presenter very smartly held up their phone and said, actually, that's the closest place to gamble right here. I mean, we could actually be gambling right now. I've got a laptop here and I got my smartphone here. Um, with the advent of um, our smartphones and the technology that we have, uh, we have very close access to gambling kind of at all times. And then if you look at this uh, image here, I actually took this picture when I was getting gas one day uh, at a gas station, the screen that comes up when you're going to uh, pump, it said video gaming inside. And so you're getting the invitation when you're outside to come inside and engage in in gambling. And then once you get in there, you can see we got energy drinks, we got candy, we've got tobacco behind uh, the counter, and we have the, the lottery machine. So lots of proximity. It's close by us. But why are we here today? We wanted to learn how can gambling affect our health. And I'm going to give you some kind of generals that apply to overall gambling and health. One, gambling tends to be a sedentary activity. If you think about, let's just think about, for example, playing slots, whether it's video slots or poker, or going to a casino and sitting in front of a slot machine. That is how it happens. It happens sitting. Um, and it's not something where people are really getting up and moving around an awful lot. Um, is, as far as a lot of online gaming that, that obviously is also going to be a very sedentary activity, playing cards. So you can imagine that it's not something where people are moving around a lot. It also can be very time consuming. One thing that I found very fascinating, there is an author, Natasha Scholl, well, she's a researcher, but she wrote a fascinating book um, about how our brains are impacted by gambling. But she referenced in a video clip that I saw of hers a study that showed that um, people with narcolepsy, so these are people who can fall asleep at very, very inopportune and unpredictable times, like while driving, um, while at work, and just fall asleep. People who uh, have narcolepsy and sit in front of a slot machine can maintain awareness and consciousness 
for hours and hours and hours and hours on end and they do not have that kind of narcoleptic uh, incident where they are uh, losing consciousness. And so there is something about the engagement with these machines that actually can hold our attention for a long period of time without interruption, even when that person's body and brain has a tendency to um, kind of shut down. So that's just very interesting on how the time can be um, caught up in this activity. And it can be very distracting from other needs. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, if you're attending to gambling very closely, what are all the things that you could and should be doing for yourself and your body that you are not doing? And we also know that gambling um, can affect and be affected by other behavioral health concerns. And so we'll talk a little bit about that later on. And then gambling, of course, like many other things, can actually in and of itself become disordered, which then becomes its own condition. But I'm going to share with you one of the first that, that we often hear about, it, which is deep vein thrombosis. I was actually, well, once you get to know me, you learn that I talk about gambling pretty much everywhere. And so I was at the doctor's office and I was talking to uh, my doctor about gambling and screening for gambling. And they disclosed that they had been working with somebody that had deep vein thrombosis and they couldn't figure out how does this happen? How is this person getting blood clots? They don't seem to sit a lot for their job. They don't fly a lot. They couldn't figure it out. And lo and behold, that person turned out to be a pretty serious gambler. And so this is an example of kind of getting to the root of having um, long extended periods of time where somebody is not moving around and very sedentary, it can lead to uh, blood clots. Now cardiac arrest can actually occur because there can be a high rate hypertension and long sustained periods of stress amongst people who are experiencing gambling problems. In addition, there is um, a tendency, I shouldn't say a tendency, but there is a correlation. Many people who develop a gambling problem also engage in excessive alcohol use and nicotine use and those two things in and of themselves can contribute to heart problems. We know that people with gambling problems or who um, kind of spend a lot of time gambling and might be experiencing some of the related concerns can have a lot of stress-related conditions and they do self-report more than the general population of headaches, ulcers, insomnia, and gastrointestinal problems, including irritable bowel syndrome. And believe it or not, now we do a lot of work with all sorts of groups, including law enforcement and attorneys and um, counselors. We'll, we'll really talk to any group about this topic because it's relevant to all of us as human beings and community members. But when we talk to law enforcement, we actually say, hey, did you ever pull over somebody who's under the influence of gambling? <laughs> and they, they kind of laugh and shake their heads. And, and the answer is probably you have. And then if you think about it, so imagine that I spent 13 hours at a slot machine. Do you think that when I then, like, you know, after my eyeballs maybe recover from seeing all the, this movement and the lights and all of that, um, and then I get in my car after that duration of time, of course I'm engaging in fatigue driving. That's just in general not a healthy way to drive. In addition, if you had spent a great deal of time um, playing and maybe you kind of lost some time, Maybe you lost a good deal of money because uh, if you think of some of the gambling phrases that we use a lot, I think we're all familiar with the phrase, the house always wins. Um, now the house doesn't always win, but the house usually wins. I think that that would be more fair to say the house usually wins. So if I'm playing for five hours, 10 hours, um, it is not likely that I've come out ahead. And so in addition to being very fatigued, I might also be very distressed thinking, oh my gosh, what did I just do? Did I really just plow through my paycheck? Did I really just take out a cash advance on my credit card to keep playing? Why did I do that? What's going to happen? Am I going to get in trouble? And so there can be a lot of distress and we can have people um, uh, driving in a very distressed state, including being very tearful. I'll tell you one time I was driving while eating sushi, which sounds so bizarre, but that's what I was doing. And I had a nice big chunk of wasabi on it, put it in my mouth and my eyes just filled with tears. And I can tell you for that moment before I could clear my vision, that was not a safe scenario. So um, if I am driving and my eyes fill with tears for whatever reason, it's not a safe scenario for driving. 
and then speeding. So why might somebody be speeding after gambling? Well, one, let's think about that time, that time that can be lost. And people can say, boy, I really thought I was sitting there for about 45 minutes. And then I, I kind of look around me and I look down at my phone and my uh, husband's been blowing up my phone saying, where are you? Where are you? We're supposed to pick up the kids. So I'm late. Maybe I'm late for work. Maybe I'm late for an appointment. Maybe uh, there was something really important that I was supposed to be at and I'm not. And so now I'm speeding. So gambling can indirectly actually lead to motor vehicle accidents. Believe it or not, people can gamble while driving. So if I can sit here and I can text while driving, um, then I can gamble while driving. And um, as we mentioned, that many uh, gambling uh, apps are now available on our phones, um, that that is something that, that can happen and does happen. Um, as, a, as a matter of fact, I've actually seen people driving while scratching lottery tickets. I mean, we've seen people driving while doing any number of things, including eating sushi. Um, not with chopsticks, that would be ridiculous. But um, we know that people can do that. People have done that. And, and again, an unsafe driving situation. Now, also think about this. Many places to gamble do, I don't want to say encourage alcohol use, but at the very least facilitate alcohol use. So alcohol is often available in places where we can gamble. And uh, for that reason, and also that some people who develop gambling problems also can have uh, alcohol problems. We can have people who are driving under the influence after a gambling episode. So driving under the influence of alcohol or other substances. Believe it or not, um, assault and domestic violence can be related to gambling. There are statistics that show this. So if there is somebody who gambled and they lost and they are very upset, maybe they're ashamed, okay? And they're kind of uh, confronted by a loved one. An assault can occur. Um, there have been many uh, um, examples of a loved one, a spouse, a significant other trying to keep that gambler from gambling, whether it's like, I'm gonna take the car keys or I'm gonna keep the money because I need this money to pay for our bills. So no, you can't have it. And then that um, gambler uh, assaults that person in their kind of desperate need to get back to gambling. So that, that can and, and does happen when we're talking about problem gambling um, and domestic violence. And believe it or not, gamblers can also be and, and, and often are the victims of domestic violence. Uh, when gambling becomes disordered, it's very often not recognized. It's not something you can see or smell, or it's just something that is often mistaken for other things. And so for that reason, it's often not discovered until it's really, really bad. And so um, a significant other or a family member may say, oh my gosh, you did what with our money? You know, our house is being foreclosed on for, for what reason? And, and it comes out and it comes out very quickly and unexpectedly and then the gambler is the victim of an assault. And then gamblers can also be assaulted due to owing money to people because gambling does require money. And if you're losing and we're gonna talk about this idea of chasing losses and you, you're kind of looking for more money to keep gambling to try to get your feet under you, you can um, borrow money from people and sometimes those people can become frustrated and sometimes that money is being borrowed in um, through channels such as a, a bookie or a, a, a loan shark and that sort of thing. Um, and when that person is not uh, forthcoming with what they owe, um, things can happen. And then believe it or not, we find that there are a number of gamblers who are actually gambling as an escape from the domestic violence that they're experiencing. So I want you to imagine and also have compassion too. So if you are at a place where there's gambling and you see people sitting, for example, sitting in a machine and they're just kind of focused on that machine, I want you to imagine we can never know uh, what is somebody's personal experience, but I want you to imagine that some people are there for the reason of back at home, things are so bad that this is their way of kind of coping with that and escaping from it and kind of zoning out from everything that they're dealing with. We know that mental wellness can be affected by gambling and that when things become unhealthy with gambling, there is a higher rate of depression. 
We know that anxiety can also be prevalent. Substance use can go hand in hand with gambling, as I mentioned, alcohol, tobacco, opiate use, um, as well as other process addictions or behavior addictions. So we're talking about food addiction, for example. These things can kind of go hand in hand with a gambling disorder. And I will tell you this, I have been working in the addictions field for about 25 years. And I always thought that's what I was. I'm an addictions counselor and I loved what I did. Um, and it wasn't until I started working um, in preventing and treating problem gambling. And then I learned about gamblers and suicide. And there is research that shows that people with gambling problems attempt suicide more than any other uh, addictive disorder. So more than alcoholism, more than opioid addiction. And that just truly broke my heart when we're talking about something that many people don't even know about. They don't even know it exists and it's taking people's lives. And so that broke my heart. And I can point to learning about that is the minute that I went from being an addictions counselor to um, a, a gambling counselor. Now we also know that, remember earlier on when I said that sometimes people can um, not pay attention to things that are important to them as a result of their gambling, one of those things is taking medication. So again, if I'm playing, whether it's at a card table, um, at a bingo hall, or at a slot machine, if I'm playing for hours and hours and hours on end, I might not be taking my medication. I might not be taking my medication because I lost my money that I needed for my copay. And I will tell you this, I knew a woman who gambled just about 20 to $40 a month. That doesn't sound like all that much, but guess what? She had very little left over from her expenses. That was about what she needed for her copays for her medication. And she month after month after month lost what little she had by gambling, didn't take her medications. And, um, and as I mentioned and had been talking about, people can lose track of time and not miss a, an important dose of, of a medication. Um, and then you can have a condition that is manageable become um, kind of irreversible. And this is what happened with this woman that I knew. She went from one manageable condition to um, a much more serious and complicated and irreversible condition by virtue of not taking her medication. And that was directly related to her gambling. Now, medications, believe it or not, can increase risk. Now, we've all seen those commercials, right? You know, take blah, blah, blah for this. And then there's this really quick laundry list of all the reasons that you should be cautious. Um, and I know they, they have so many that they have to talk really fast to make the writing really small. Um, but I will just urge people that if one of those conditions is um, impulsive or compulsive gambling, take it seriously because we have encountered many people who went from being kind of what you would call a recreational or a social gambler to a problem gambler after starting um, some, some of these medications. So some examples of medications that have been found to increase the risk for developing a gambling problem. One is Abilify, another is Mirapex, uh, levodopa, so Abilify for bipolar disorder, Mirapex and Levodopa um, can be used for Parkinson's, as well as Mirapex it can be used for restless leg syndrome. So a number of different um, conditions that, that these medications can be used for, but they can actually lead to uh, uh, gambling disordered behavior. Believe it or not, on the flip side of that, there are medications that can help. So if somebody is struggling with the way that they gamble, there are medications out there that can actually help. So naltrexone, if anybody is, has heard of that, that might sound familiar to you. This is something that has been found to help people who are trying to abstain from alcohol use or from opioid use. And it has been found to also help uh, gamblers by reducing cravings, whether it's the intensity of the cravings or the frequency of the cravings. Now, Vivitrol is a medication that is an extended release monthly injection of naltrexone. And so that can be very helpful for people to kind of just take care of once a month and for a month have this steady kind of level of naltrexone in their system to try to help them manage um, the way that they had been gambling before. Now, hopefully I pronounced this right, 
forgive me if I don't, N-acetylcysteine, you can call it NAC, that's easier, is an amino acid. It's actually not a medication, so it's not by prescription. Um, it is uh, a supplement that people can get at um, you know, pretty much any health food place. Um, and it has a lot of research behind it showing that it can really help people manage um, um, kind of disordered gambling. So whether it's medication that is prescribed or over the counter, um, it is always important to consult with a physician about the uh, suitability of that for uh, an individual given their system, given their history, given other medications that they're on. So please don't take um, hearing that this is something that's over the counter and, and as a supplement as like, go ahead and try this. Um, anything like that is worth running by your physician. Now here's a subject that I think many people find interesting and I find it very interesting. And I put up on the screen here for people who are, want to learn a little bit more than what we're going to talk about, a website, brainfacts.org. And if you search for uh, gambling in the brain and you'll find some really interesting imagery as well as information and research. But uh, our brain is just really, really an impressive and complicated and important organ and it is affected by gambling and it affects our gambling in really interesting ways. So near misses, these reflect when you are gambling and you almost win. Our brain does something really interesting when we almost win. And um, to give you a visual of that, if you imagine, imagine um, a, a slot machine. And so picture the machine, picture the window in it, and the three dials and imagine that somebody pulls the handle or presses the button and those those things spin and then we get a, a cherry that, that settles in we get another cherry and then we get a gold bar but right up in the top part of this window we see a little bit of the cherry peeking out that's a near miss and our, it is proven through brain imaging that near misses are extremely reinforcing to our brain almost winning for many people can be more reinforcing to the brain than actually winning. So it's kind of like, ooh, I almost won. And I am just going to um, you know, keep playing and because I'm 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 on a hot streak. And so that's just a really interesting thing to know. It's just good for us to know so that if we decide to gamble and we have that near miss, we can go, okay, that doesn't mean anything. It truly doesn't mean anything, and it for sure doesn't mean that I should elevate the intensity or the duration of my play. Now this is something that's very interesting too. How, um, how we win in that reinforcement schedule does affect um, you know, how, how reinforcing that is to the brain. So there's a lot of studies going way back on the brain on, on rewards and punishment and um, I'll, I'll kind of describe one for you. So imagine um, that there is a, a, a little mouse or a rat in a, in a box, in a cage, and it has a lever that it can press to get a pellet of food. So it presses the pellet or the lever and then the little pellet comes out. If they do that and they get that food, well, food is very rewarding to the brain. We know that. Um, so they're like, cool. And they press that button again. And guess what? A pellet comes out and they're like, that was great, and they press it again. Now, it has been proven that if, if that lever, if every time I press that lever, a, a rewarding thing comes out, a piece of food comes out, I'm not gonna be overly excited about it for very long. But if I press that button and I get a piece of food and I press it again and I don't, and then I press it again and I don't, but I press it again and I do, that's when I start going, ooh, you know, I don't know when I'm gonna get a piece of food. And so it's been proven that that rat can sit in that cage when it has this, what's called an intermittent variable reinforcement schedule, meaning it changes. Like sometimes it's every fifth time and then it's every 18th time and then it's the seventh time um, variable, it changes ratio, um, that that rat will just sit there and press that lever just over and over and over and over and over. And so, I, you know, nobody likes being compared to rats, but they have, you know, I guess very similar structures in their brains. Um, and it's important for us to know that the way that some of these games work are very reinforcing to our brains. And so it just helps us to know 
hey, if I start feeling very compelled um, to keep sitting here and pressing this button or pulling that lever, this could be just a function of the game and how it interacts with my brain. And I really shouldn't give more meaning to it than that. And I should really be careful. Okay. And we'll talk about how to be careful later on. So the reward system in the brain actually can kind of light up with different kind of brain imagery. And I wish I had one to show you, but I, I don't, I didn't want to, I couldn't find a non-copyrighted image and I don't want to steal um, somebody's image, but there are brain scans that show um, uh, the reward system being activated in somebody who has a cocaine addiction, who is thinking about cocaine. Okay, or they've been shown it a, a picture of cocaine, and then this reward system really activates. They have shown um, brain scans of a, a gambler, and this is a problem gambler, not just, just a recreational gambler, but a problem gambler who is imagining playing. Those same uh, areas of the brain light up. So it's very interesting that your brain can interpret gambling very much the way it interprets a substance being ingested into the body. Um, and so for that reason, we really, again, should be cautious, just like we know to be very cautious about substance use. Um, this is another thing in our community to just be really wary and, and, and um, cautious about. Now, this is something that I find really, really fascinating, and it is how our memories work with regards to gambling. So. If you ask anybody and think about it, everybody in, in, you know, on this workshop who's either here now or watching it later knows somebody who gambles as kind of it's part of their life, whether they're a serious gambler, they're a recreational gambler, they're a social gambler. Um, you know that you have people in your life that do engage in gambling. If you ask them, hey, overall, how are you doing? Are you up, down, or are you even? Nine times out of 10, they're going to say, I'm up, or they're going to say even. You are very, very, very rarely going to have somebody say to you, oh, yeah, I'm really in the hole. I'm 20 grand in the hole um, overall from my gambling. And guess what? They're not necessarily lying to you. The way that our brains work, and this is proven by research, we remember things that are salient, so things that are very meaningful for longer and we remember them much more clearly than memories that are not salient. And research has proven that wins are more salient than losses. So that means that over time, um, we think we're doing better than we are. And it's just the way our brains work. And it doesn't make us liars and it doesn't make us stupid. It just makes us human beings. And it's just another one of those things for anybody who is back from you know my age or older you remember gi joe do you remember what they used to say knowledge is power um and so just knowing this just knowing that if you think you're doing well with gambling whether that you're even or you're up over time that you may not be right you're, you're actually probably wrong <laughs> and we'll talk a little bit later on about well what to do about that now that we know that how can we try to um, keep things controlled and safe if we do choose. Um, and then there's also research that shows that we are averse to losing, you know, and that just kind of makes sense. Nobody wants to lose something. They don't want to lose a loved one. They don't want to lose their stuff. Um, and then how we respond as a result can be kind of rooted in our uh, chemistry. So I'm going to play a brief clip for you I would like somebody to either unmute themselves or pop in the chat if there's any problem with the audio. And it's a brief clip, just a few minutes, and talking about why we chase losses. We'll talk about chasing losses in a minute, but this is the why of it. So give me a minute to get this started. Picture yourself in a casino. You put down a $100 bet. You lose. Do you keep playing or do you walk away? In most people, the part of your brain that tells you to keep playing is stronger than the part of your brain that lets you walk away. Don't believe me? There's a city in the middle of the desert that was built because people have a hard time walking away after they lose. So why is there such a strong urge to keep throwing money on the table after a loss? 
It's because deep inside of our brains, there's something very powerful called loss aversion. Basically, our brains hate pain. It doesn't matter if it's physical pain, emotional pain, or the pain of losing something like money. Our brains will do whatever they can to not have us experience the feeling of pain. Many times, this is great. It protects us, it's helped our ancestors, it allows us to survive. But there are times in our modern life where our brain is trying to protect us, but it's really hurting us. Let me give you a silly example. Do you have a shirt or a sweater that you will never wear again, but every time you go to your closet to throw it away, you just can't do it? That's loss aversion. Believe it or not, getting rid of that shirt or sweater is gonna cause you some sort of pain in your brain. And your brain decides instead to leave that shirt in your closet to save you from experiencing that pain. So something similar is happening when we're playing blackjack and we throw more money on the table after a loss. Our brain hates that feeling of pain associated with losing. And our brain wants us to win as soon as possible so we minimize the time we're experiencing that painful loss. Loss aversion can get serious. People can stay in bad relationships because they're afraid of the pain of the breakup. Or people can hold on to losing stocks or bad investments for the fear of letting go. So the next time you find yourself at the blackjack table, clearing out your closet, or making some big life decision, ask yourself, am I making the best decision or is my brain protecting me from pain which could end up hurting me in the long run? Thanks for watching A Dose of Science and I for one think I made at least one very bad decision today. that he shared that information there we go um, so before we get to this next topic I think we can all imagine that that we all have things that we have a hard time letting go of and it's interesting to see that there are some kind of biological um, components to why we are that way and to apply that to gambling behavior and just to know um, about those uh, chasing losses and why people might stick around. And so we do, time allowing, have a little time later in this workshop to talk about responsible or non-disordered gambling strategies. And one of those is to not do that. Don't chase losses. And we'll talk about that a little bit more if we get time for it. But because this is something that is so timely and that is affecting all of us, statewide, worldwide, is COVID, um, and we know that almost every aspect of our lives has been impacted by this. So you might wonder, how does this relate to gambling? Well, it actually does relate to gambling in quite a few ways. Everything that's been happening has been very, very stressful. And as I mentioned before, some people do turn to gambling as a way of coping with stress. I have to tell you, uh, for example, I'm somebody who doesn't like conflict. I don't like to hear people yelling at each other. And I was in a meeting one time and two of my colleagues were just kind of like griping at each other and i kept reaching for my phone and i don't know why i just wanted to open it and check my email and i'm not usually that kind of person that's just like attached to the phone um but i kept finding myself doing that and i realized that was my attempt at kind of like self-soothing um, is just, and we know that people do, um, whether it's going on Facebook or reading their email or checking their text messages, it can become a very self-soothing type of activity. And likewise, gambling, whether it's online, whether it's at, a, at an establishment, uh, whether it's going and, and doing scratch lottery tickets, for some people can be a way of self-soothing. And we've had a huge increase in stressful circumstances during COVID, and some people have unfortunately turned to gambling as a means of coping with that. Now, guess what's also increased uh, di during COVID? Financial worries. And unfortunately, when you're looking at ways of dealing with worry, isn't gambling a way that at least in advertisements is promoted as a way to earn. And so some people, in addition to turning to gambling um, due to stress, can turn to gambling during COVID and have turned to gambling during COVID as a means of actually trying to deal with the financial 
fallout of what's been happening to them, whether, I mean, I sat, I was at an event, um, a fundraiser, which we will also talk about shortly. Um, and I ran into an old friend of mine who um, is, is somewhat, um, he's probably in his early seventies and his um, occupation is in the um, restaurant industry. And he has significantly lost work and hours and, and income during COVID. Um, you know, and it's been very, very worrisome for him. And so you can imagine that people who are faced with loss of work, loss of hours, loss of income, and then also increased costs. I don't know about you guys, but my grocery bill has gone up and I'm not buying anymore. <laughs> so so uh, costs of things are going up. And so people can sometimes think, oh, I see this ad, which Suzanne and I were talking about. I got this thing in the mail that says, hey, risk-free. Um, here's a thousand dollar, you know, startup bonus to play this, this type of gambling. So that could be very alluring for people, um, when they're facing financial worries. And so we are, we do have people who are reaching out to us during this time saying that this is kind of amplified, uh, the way that they gamble and they're worried about it. Now we know that a lot of people are at home a lot more, whether it's just that the type of recreation that they do is not available for them maybe they're working from home or they've lost work. Um, people are kind of homebound a lot more than they have been during normal times. And for that reason, people are actually spending a lot more time online. I don't know if you've seen that, that things are crashing and, and internet prices are going up uh, because there is just such a demand. And so people are online and are at home a lot more. Now, one thing that Suzanne and I had talked about is um, fundraising. So I work for a nonprofit. Pretty much every nonprofit in the world uses some sort of gambling to try to help fundraise, whether it's raffle tickets or auctions or that sort of thing. And because a lot of um, different types of um, agencies and um, charities are struggling right now, um, you might be faced with additional fundraising uh, requests, even beyond what you're used to. And um, keeping in mind, I actually knew a number of people over the course of my career as a gambling counselor who part of their logic and rationale behind their gambling was that it was charity, that they were the, the, the money that they lost was actually going towards a good cause. And we know that some parts of you know, regulated gambling do find their way to fund the schools and um, and obviously the direct fundraising from charities and nonprofits. And so people with very, very good intentions can be engaging in gambling to try to help out kind of something that's happening in their community. But guess what? Some of us, you know, are affected by gambling in other ways, um, in different ways than others. And so that can be just a way that people are participating in gambling who don't usually, or participating in gambling more than they usually do. And we know that the availability of gambling changed a lot during COVID, and it was pretty dramatic, and it, it's kind of happening back and forth. And so kind of early in the early days, in case you didn't notice, they shut the casinos down and they shut down video gaming um, uh, terminals. And um, this was, due to trying to contain um, spread of, of the uh, COVID virus. And however, one thing that we didn't mention when we talk about gambling in the brain and gambling in the system, if somebody plays very regularly and intensely and they abruptly stop, that can actually be very challenging for them. That can actually bring about what those who are familiar with alcohol and drugs withdrawal, it's a form of withdrawal. They can become very irritable, they can be very restless, very anxious, and some can even become very depressed. So those um, establishments closing down very abruptly for some people has led to some struggles. Now guess what happens in addition to all those worries and, and distress that they're experiencing, they sometimes then go to another form of gambling that is still available. So, for example, lottery didn't shut down. For example, online didn't online gambling didn't shut down. As a matter of fact, there were types of gambling that were not available um, to begin um, without going to an in-person establishment that became available online. So you didn't have to step foot 
in a door anywhere, you could just register online. And so, um, you know, we have a lot more people gambling online um, than in previous times. And we work with one company um, that provides a, a, a product that'll actually block online gambling on your devices. So your phone, your laptop, your computer at work, your computer at home. Um, and we actually will purchase that for our clients if they need it. But I had a meeting with them recently and the demand for their product has skyrocketed. So the, the numbers are really playing out that there are a lot more people gambling online during COVID and that a lot more people are struggling with gambling online during COVID. Otherwise they wouldn't be then reaching out um, for a product that's gonna help them to not access those, those, uh, those programs. Another thing just to bear in mind is that funding for nonprofits and other and charities is, is really at risk as um, the revenues, just, just state revenues, um, have really plummeted as a result of a lot of the, the different types of establishments closing. And so that can have a, an impact because um, social services and behavioral health and um, different uh, resources that are available for people become less available as a result. Um, another topic to talk about, I've mentioned problem gambling, I've mentioned gambling disorder. Those are two things that are the same thing, but I use those terms interchangeably. But we need to know that gambling disorder is a health condition. It is a behavioral health condition. It is recognized by the American Psychiatric Association and the World Health Organization. So um, when we're talking about gambling disorder or problem gambling, I really don't want people to, to think kind of the way we used to think about some types of addictive disorders as like a moral thing or just a decision. That person's just choosing to do this. These are recognized by these um, very um, well-established and respected entities as being disorders in and of themselves. Um, and according to um, the Affordable Care Act and um, behavioral health parity, these are supposed to be covered under insurance. Unfortunately, they're very often not covered. And then we also have people who due to the great amount of stigma and shame that can come with any addictive disorder, let alone one that people don't even understand or believe exists, um, they choose not to use their insurance. They're fearful that, that um, their employer will find out. And so that's very discouraging because this is a treatable condition. Um, and so here's where we kind of shift gears and talk about something that we did mention in our last uh, uh, part of the series, but it's super important. Um, we're really used to reducing risk. And, and so there are risks all around us and we're good at figuring out a way to mitigate those risks. So if I'm a, uh, well, no, I'm not, I would never play football, but if I was a football player, I sure would be wearing a helmet. Um, and all the padding, like you've seen our athlete on here wearing, and we put our seatbelts on hopefully every time we're in a motor vehicle and we wear safety glasses and we wear a helmet. I took my stepson for his physical and the doctor said, um, how often does he wear his helmet? And I said, 100% of the time. And he looked at him and he said, do you really? And he's like, you really? Because <laughs> I won't let him step foot on that bike or the skateboard without that helmet. And likewise, we're all you know, keeping our masks handy and making sure that we're wearing our masks during this time. So we do this every day and we can do this if we do choose to gamble. Um, so how do we do that? One, we see the cost of gambling as the price for that recreation. And I'll never forget, I just thought it was the neatest, you know, analogy. I was at a training and they said, you don't go into the movie theater thinking you're going to come out with more money than you went in with. Of course you don't. You know that those tickets are expensive and the popcorn and the, the gallon container of, of soda or lemonade or whatever you're, you're drinking and the jujubes or uh, whatever you're putting uh, along with your popcorn and you, you just make peace with that and you budget for that. And so likewise, if gambling is going to be a part of your life, it is a form of recreation and let's just uh, budget for it and, and don't expect to win, expect to lose. Play with your own money. Um, that means not borrowing money, um, not borrowing money from your future self, which is what you do when you use credit, um, not using money that you need for bills or other expenses or money that you need to put in the savings account. So this is your extra money. And I don't know about you guys, but I have a lot of extra money. Um, 
And so it is really um, what you do with what's left and making a decision about how much you are willing to play. So setting a limit and sticking to them. So um, we're gonna talk about a dollar limit. So if I, let's say I wanna play bingo, I will go with whatever it is, $25, $40, I don't even know um, what would be a reasonable amount, but you take that with you, you don't take anything else, you don't dip back into the purse, you don't go to an ATM, um, you just set that limit and when it's gone, you, you are gone too, you know? Um, and then also a time limit. So as I mentioned before, you can lose vast amounts of time with gambling. It's something that can just really draw your attention. And then before you know it, you're like, wow, it's dark out. <laughs> you know. So really setting a time limit, like I'm going to go to this place and I'm going to do this for one hour, for two hours and sticking to it. Maybe even setting an alarm just to try to help remind you. And then you've got a little uh, parentheses here that says consider a logbook. So to try to help our community members, if you do choose to gamble, to try to play it safe, we have created these little log books uh, that allow you to, in the front, choose ahead of time, which is when to do it, how much you're willing to play with and for how long um, to kind of commit to that in writing. And then guess what? Actually write down what date you did, what you did, how much you played, how much you lost or won. Um, and then a place to kind of tally that periodically. So remember how we talked about gambling and memory and how we don't want to leave um, uh, how we're doing to our faulty memories because our, our brains are going to tell us that we're doing much better than we are. This can help you to combat that. So I will say that when I have my contact information later on in the workshop, if, if you or your group might be interested in, in um, obtaining some of these log books. Of course, they're at no cost to Lake County community members who are of legal adult age to gamble and who want to try to do so responsibly. In addition to those setting uh, limits, it also has the, the tips for responsible gaming listed and um, the signs of when it is not responsible and then contact information to get help for, for you or anyone that you care about. And so we remember that nice little clip that he had about chasing losses and not chasing losses. So he said, you gotta quit when you lose. And that's hard given the way our brains are structured to quit when we lose. Um, but you also need to quit when you win because he didn't mention that and, and a lot of people don't talk about that. But if you think about somebody, because gambling is one of those things where sometimes people win. Okay, it's not, it's not a complete facade. You, you know, some people pull that lever and well, I would say that the little coins come out, but they don't come out anymore, do they? But the little slip of paper comes out with the winnings or, you know, sometimes people, their, their hand beats the dealer's hand and they win. So people do win sometimes, but guess what they also often do? They often just keep playing and give some of it back, give all of it back. Sometimes they give all of it back and then they're freaking out that they lost their winnings and then they start losing. Um, so it can be a really, really quick uh, downward spiral. So whether it's lose or win, it's quit. That's just a really good, um, you know, uh, rule of thumb here. And we definitely want to discourage underage play. So this is something where I want to really normalize um, something here. There was a time in our culture that we were not aware of how risky it is to provide alcohol to young people. And given research that came out and a lot of kind of public awareness stuff, we all know better now. It's not to say adults don't still, in some circumstances, provide uh, alcohol to minors, but we know better. We know that biologically that brain is not equipped yet um, to handle that alcohol and prevent um, some of the harmful consequences as much as an adult fully formed and developed brain, which is really truly 24, 25, 26, not 21, by the way, but um, regardless, we know better. What we don't know better right now as a culture is that the same thing applies with gambling, okay? So I really want for anybody who's listening or watching right now, I don't want you going, oh my gosh, I give lottery tickets to the kids at Christmas or uh, in their birthday presents. I don't want you to freak out and beat yourself up. I just want you to stop. <laughs> I just want you to go, yeah, we decided not to do that this year. This year, I made you homemade cookies um, or, or whatever it is that you want to do in your holiday gift giving 
um, is to really stop facilitating young people to engage in gambling. Um, I will say here, this is where it can get really tough. Uh, we could do a whole other thing, a whole other series on video gaming, and maybe we will. Unfortunately, um, there are so many features of video gaming that are indistinguishable to our brains, to gambling, that there are some very, very highly addictive features of video gaming um, that are to be of concern for parents. So please keep in mind if you or young people are playing video games that are in any kind of way attached to a uh, credit card, um, and actual funds, um, that that's something to be very wary of because some of the features of the game are basically gambling. You're risking something um, of value, money, on something that you don't know what you're going to get. And this is what are called loot boxes for those of you who are aware. And you don't know what's going to get, you know, in there. Is it a weapon? Is it a, you know, a free life? What is it? It's going to advance your play or not. And so that is, that is gambling by our definition. And so please be careful and maybe just pay attention. Um, we'll, and we will talk a lot more about this when we do our teen gambling workshop that is in November. More ways to play safe with gambling. Don't use gambling to cope. We all know that it's not a healthy mechanism for coping to, to drink alcohol or to use drugs. Likewise, don't use gambling as a way to cope. Really try to lean on those friends and uh, supportive people in your life and, and meditation and, and, and exercise and anything else that can be useful for coping with difficult times. And then don't mix gambling with alcohol. As I mentioned, that can be a little bit odd when it's kind of right there in many, many gambling establishments. But what do we know about alcohol? We know it's a disinhibitor. Inhibitions are good when you're gambling, okay? So when you think about, boy, I'm saving up for that trip, or my kid has to go to college in a couple of years. Um, when, if you combine alcohol with gambling, those, those values and those needs and, and um, things that are important to you become less important um, and less meaningful. And uh, you may end up risking more than you really should or wanted to had you been of sober mind when you were participating in, in gambling. So really, really avoid alcohol use when gambling. Um, eventually, when we go back to in-person um, uh, participation in uh, watching sporting events, um, you know, we really need to be careful about that. Because if you go to a stadium, you got the peanuts coming down one aisle, the hot dogs here, and you got the beer guy or the beer gale. And so we know that a lot of sporting events really do kind of um, go hand in hand with alcohol. And now guess what? We added in gambling to that. And there's gonna be kiosks where you can gamble or you can be gambling on your phone from the stands. And so we sure don't wanna mix uh, gambling and alcohol in those settings or really in any setting. And take cautions on medications seriously. I have um, a former client who is just like one of the coolest people and he goes out and sometimes talks to different groups about his experiences because he's one of those people that was a, a recreational social gambler and, and developed a, an illness that he had to take one of these medications that we talked about for and became a uh, what he calls a compulsive gambler, and it caused a lot of problems for him. And he said, you know, I knew that. I knew that it said you could have all these different things, and I didn't get these different things. I got this one, and this really hurt me, and it hurt my family. Um, and so take it seriously. And if if you experience any, um, and not saying don't take the medication, <laughs> but really maybe put some safeguards in place against disordered gambling, but if you experience um, disorder gambling or other kind of impulsive behaviors to really talk to the physician about it and see and if there's any way that they can help you with that. And then be familiar with the warning signs of a gambling problem and then know what resources are available to help. Um, I do think that I will play this clip here. This is a clip that is um, a way to kind of show everybody that this can happen to anyone. So again, we're all human beings, um, you know, developing a gambling problem um, or just experiencing problems related to gambling does not make somebody weak, irresponsible or stupid. It makes you human. And so this is an example I'd like to share with you. And then we'll um, kind of move on to some of those closing topics. 
kicking off a series addicted to with a woman who is opening up about her problems with gambling and more. Sandra Udell became a mother as a teenager, later working her way off of welfare to become a prominent professor at the University of Wisconsin. But in 2005, she almost lost it all when one fateful trip to a Wisconsin casino nearly derailed her life. Watch. Sandra's first taste of gambling came in 2005 when her friend invited her to a casino. It was disturbing. The moment I walked in to the casino, um, I was immediately bothered by the environment. First of all, it stank. When I was walking around in this place and looking and thinking, how can this be fun? A few spins of the slot machine and she won an $1,100 jackpot. It out crisp hundred dollar bills into my hand. I wanted to go back. So now I have to have a reason to go back. So I decided, well, I'm going to pretend to be, you know, like I'm going to do some investigative journalism and seeing what, you know, what's inside, what can I write about? But Sandra's so-called research visits were just an excuse to keep gambling. More and more and more. I would often leave and I'd feel sick. Now I'm starting to drink more. So I'm getting a double dose of all of this you know, overstimulation and getting drunker and drunker because I hate myself for being there. I hated myself for being in these casinos. And in my journal, so many of the entries say, this is unhealthy, this is dangerous, why are you doing this? And I started taking out advances on my credit card. Then I started going into my salary, using my earnings to gamble. This is like, and it was very rapid. This was a very rapid decline. And it's all, uh, along the way, I'm telling myself, I need to stop because I'm going to destroy everything. I'm going to destroy my life. Her first major scare came when leaving a casino after a night of heavy gambling and drinking. And I went outside to go to my car. And just as I got to the car, I saw something glittering on, on the floor, on the ground, right by my car. And I bent down to pick it up. It was a woman's watch. And when I, the next thing I know, I was being lifted off the ground. And they said, well, give us your car keys. You're too drunk to drive. And so I did. After that, Sandra says, she stopped gambling for over a year. But the drinking continued. And one night while drunk, she had the urge for those slot machines again and got behind the wheel. I got stopped because I was apparently wavering like this. And the next thing I know, there are some lights behind me. It's the police. And it's like, they can't be pulling me over. And the next thing I know, this guy screamed at me and said, you're drunk. Turn around. and." I was handcuffed and put in the back of the car. Joining me now, Sandra Adele, who details her addiction in a memoir called Confessions of a Slot Machine Queen. Sandra, good morning. Thank you. <laughs> it's a great book title. Uh, I know it was less than great to live it. So right. let's, before we get to that moment in the back of the police car, let's go back to the first time you went into the casino. So you weren't like a gambler. You weren't some sort of gambling lover. No, not at all. <clears throat> in fact, uh, nobody in my family gambles. And so, uh, but your friend d d sort of hooked you into it. Well, she just took me to the casino and um, I won. But I was also very, very nervous about the space itself because it, it wasn't healthy. It didn't feel good. You knew that. I knew that from the beginning, yes. Do you think if you hadn't won that first time, this would have happened? It wouldn't have happened. Um, that's the hook. And also the other part was that uh, after I won the money, I put money back into the machine. And I think I lost about $180. And then I started worrying about that. I mean, why would I sit there and lose this money? Yep. You know, $1,000 is a lot of money. Uh, so that's the beginning of it. I began to worry about it. But then I also wanted to go back because now I thought, oh, there's something interesting to write about here. Mm -hmm. that's and you, the, you convinced yourself as an academic. Yes. yes, I did. That this would be an academic project for you. Right. You could blow the lid off of casinos. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> And so, like, what was it? The what was the very first sign that this has spun out of control? Because it wasn't like bankruptcy. No, uh, it was the emotional, uh, the emotional, the internal struggle that I had going on, as, especially as I began to lose money and started, uh, you know, dipping into my um, my earnings. You know, money changes value. I like to tell people that in the casino, you have the casino's money that you won out of the machines. And then you have your own money. 
So my deal was like, okay, if I'm going to go and do this research and I have to research this and, you know, and, 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 and play the slots and see what it feels like and write about it, um, I will only use the money that I got out of the machines. Their money. Their money, right. Mm -hmm. uh, and not my money. Well, that changed after a while. Then I'm using my money. And then I, w I was becoming increasingly sick. I mean, feeling physically sick. And inside of me, uh, every time I went into the casino, I would say, you know, you work too hard. This is risky because you're going to lose. You, you know, it's the casino. The house always wins. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to lose Especially in the Especially on the slots. On the slots, you're going to lose, yeah. Right. And so it was an ongoing struggle there. And the more I got, uh, continued to go, there was this pull. I mean, sometimes I would be doing just my normal things. I am, I'm a very active woman. And I would stop and go to the casino. And it was like, this is not making sense. Mm -hmm. What's happening to me? But the whole system, Sandra says, is designed to reel you in and keep you in and keep you coming back. The academic was doing some research <laughs> uh, and was taking notes for all I of that. Notes for everything. And we're gonna have more on that um, right after the break, don't go away. So Sandra Adele is a university professor, a mother and a grandmother, and she is also an addict. Today she's sober and sharing her story as written in Confessions of a Slot Machine Queen with the hope of helping others. So let's go to that moment. You're, you're going around to the casinos, you're spending more, you're telling yourself it's research, and then you find yourself in the back of a police car. Yeah. Was that the aha moment for you? Uh, that was the second aha moment. The first one. <laughs> <laughs> there are a couple. Yeah, the first one was in May uh, 2007 when I got drunk uh, at a casino. I had gone in and I decided, it was late at night, and I decided, that was the night of, uh, that I fell out, passed out. Yeah. I decided that I was going to find the jackpot. It had to be there and I was going to find it. And I needed to get in and get out. Uh, and then when I went out, uh, uh, just really tired and frustrated and drunk, uh, just as I got to my car, I saw the, uh, the watch. I fell down, passed out. Uh, I didn't know I had passed out until the next morning. They told me I had. Uh, I put myself into uh, gateway uh, recovery that time. And then I started also working with uh, a personal counselor, a uh, therapist. Uh, and for a couple of years then, uh, things did okay. Did okay, yeah. And you relapsed. The relapse was uh, in uh, June, June 10th, two July 10th, 2009. Um, again, uh, I think that I might have been going sporadically to the casinos, and I decided again that uh, uh, this time, all right, I'm just going to go finish myself off here, um, I think. Uh, but I was very drunk, uh, and I got arrested, and then the whole experience of getting arrested, being handcuffed and taken to jail uh, was like, okay, this is it. I need to do something I, about I'm this. I'm in so much trouble. You know, there's a question about how this successful college professor could have no inkling to gamble, could go into a casino one night, win 1100 I mean, 1100 bucks is good, but it's not like, you know, right. 11 million. <laughs> um, and then have such a Jones that her entire life gets wrapped around gambling like that. So Nancy Irwin is here. She's a psychotherapist specializing in addiction at Seasons Recovery Centers in California. She's not um, your therapist, but how can that be? How can that be that it can go like that? Absolutely, because addictions have nothing to do with level of intelligence. And the casinos don't care she's got a PhD. But, but, the, but the, the need, the urge to kick in so strongly, she went from not wanting to do it all to thinking about nothing sure. else. Many people who suffer from gambling addictions are genetically predisposed, meaning there's a, um, an abnormality on the dopamine receptor in the brain, which sets them up to have an impulse control disorder. So even at a later age in life, she wasn't in her 20s when she started this, it can take on at any time. So the brain is actively looking for the next high. And casinos, of course, slot machines are absolutely master manipulators. You cannot beat the house. Mm -hmm. Of course, we We've all heard about big wins and they occur. Yeah. But the reason they're so successful in making so much money and tantalizing addicts is because they use a variable ratio of reward response. Meaning you get enough small wins we all that you're know baited what you mean. in. Yeah. Exactly. Don't you know what yeah. she means? Yes. You're there, you've lost, you've lost. And just as you say out loud, I'm done after this last one, it makes you win. 
It's exactly. like it's in your head right. that it knows you're yes. about to walk away. So was there, did you feel that you had an addictive personality? I mean, the alcoholism must have played a, it, a it role. It must have, but also uh, keep in mind that many of the gamblers, most gamblers in the casinos are smokers. Uh, for me, it was, I don't know, well, I'm, I'm sure the alcoholism certainly played a role in it, but it's the rapidity and the, uh, and the repetition of the machines that really get you, and they're very interactive now. Mm -hmm. uh, and everything about the casino just it, it appeals to your senses. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that I was being overstimulated. Uh, and because this happened very, very fast. And your family didn't know. No, no your, one knows. They, no, I was just walking around, you know, being me. <laughs> <laughs> and you seem charming. <laughs> <laughs> they know now, though, right? I mean, part yeah. of your recovery, you're sober now. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And you're, you're off of gambling. Yes, yes. And, I, and part of it is that people know, right? The accountability. Yeah, I'm accountable. But also, there's the concern that I have as a black woman I, because when, when I started really doing some serious research, you know. Uh, I could not find it. <laughs> <laughs> the real kind, not the fake kind. <laughs> I couldn't find, I, I found very little written about women in gambling. Almost nothing about gambling in, in the African American community. And this is a big surprise to me because I'm from Detroit. Detroit has three enormous casinos. I know that people are suffering from addictions, but where are they? Where are the women? Uh, and it's not easy to stand up here, to sit here and tell you that I had this experience because this, and I call it an experience with gambling, this gambling disorder behavior. I come up with all kinds of names now because addict is too heavy a burden for me to bear. It's too heavy a label. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm finding other ways to express it. Uh, and I'm wondering if we take the word addict out of this, would more women come forth and say, look, I have, I'm, 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 this is disordered behavior mm -hmm. uh, and I need help with it uh, and I need to find a place to go. I Where heard, are they going? I've heard a lot of people who struggle with alcohol say, I'm not an addict, but I'm an abuser. Yeah. And I think a lot of people feel more comfortable saying that. And that could be a first step if you are somebody who's struggling with this issue right now and feel, as Sandra does, that you don't like that word. The point is to get well yeah. and to save yourself from an environment that can be overstimulating and titillating in a way that could for some be potentially dangerous. Um, Sandra, thank you so much. Thank Highly you. recommend the book. Thank you as well, Nancy. All right, so um, I find that clip to be very, very fascinating and I hope you did too. Every time I watch it, I get something new from it. Um, but related to our topic, one of the things that I didn't have a slide about is the gender differences. And so that is something that is a real thing. There was a time uh, in history where at least as far as the pre prevalent studies that it looked like men far outnumbered women with regards to disordered gambling. And unfortunately, uh, or, or fortunately, however you want to look at it, the, the gap is narrowing and it's, it's becoming almost equal. But what is very different is there's a phenomenon called telescoping that, that has been found to happen with women, which is that the onset of gambling tends to come later for women than for men, but it progresses much faster. And so it is really important. As we talk about, we said, look around our community, there's opportunities to gamble all around us. Some of those types of gambling being much more appealing to women um, than maybe past. So for example, if I'm you know, my current age of 46 and I decide to gamble for the first time, am I likely to, to go to a casino, you know, or am I going to go to the little shop that opened up right next to my Walgreens that has a chandelier and nice carpeting and, and, and it's very kind of welcoming and non-threatening. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, types of gambling that are more available and accessible to women now. And um, for that reason, it's really important to know about that telescoping. And so that if there are gonna be uh, kind of disordered ways of gambling happening in somebody that we need to kind of interrupt that pretty quickly um, so that we don't kind of develop the full disorder in the matter of months, whereas it can take years with men. Um, do know that there is help available. And if you remember only one thing from talking today, remember 1-800-GAMBLER. I think we can all remember that. And anywhere in Illinois, no matter where somebody is, if they call that number 24-7, they will have access to uh, counselors who can help connect them with counseling, 
um, or support and other ideas on how to support themselves or their loved ones who are struggling. There is a website, we know the that also has a live chat function to connect with those 1 800 Gambler or Helpline staff. Uh, Gamblers Anonymous is a 12 step support group, much like Alcoholics Anonymous, but specific to gambling. And you can go to their website at gachicago.org or call their phone number. And then if you've heard of Al Anon or Al Ateen, which are support groups for loved ones, people struggling with alcoholism, there's a similar group for uh, family members and loved ones of people struggling with gambling disorder. So you can go to gammonon.org or call them for meeting information. As with many other things, meetings are typically happening by Zoom currently versus in person. Um, and then know that there is something called the Illinois Problem Gambling Registry. It is a great resource, just very, very unfortunately named because it just doesn't sound like what it is. Uh, if anybody has any ideas of what that should be called instead, uh, let me know and I'll pass that on to the powers that be because we need more people on this list and what this is It's it's all it is is you you go to this uh, Website or you call this number you give them your email address and once a month in your inbox There'll be a list of current resources to help problem gamblers. That's good information I get that email every month and I look at it because whenever things um, Develop and there's new resources. I want to know about it. So I hope that you will consider um, going and um, getting that feature added to your email. Um, NICASA, we are a resource in the community thanks to the support that we have from the state and local. Um, and do keep in mind that there are about 25 providers statewide. Thankfully, the state has done a great job of trying to expand um, what is available for people statewide. There was a time where there were only six, eight, nine providers, and so they're really trying to offer more. We are here in Lake County, and we do offer free counseling for gambling um, and for the loved ones of gamblers. And we have lots of educational workshops like this um, remotely right now, but we'll do them in person when things allow for that to be done more safely. Um, and we have free training um, for people, whether they're youth or adults, who want to be uh, part of a speakers bureau to go and talk. Because uh, if I go and talk to a bunch of 16-year-olds about uh, gambling disorder, it's probably not going to be as impactful uh, as if I have an 18-year-old go and talk to them about why they choose not to gamble and what are the risks and why do they uh, avoid those risks and how do they avoid those risks. So I'm very, very hopeful of getting people in the community mobilized and we will help them um, put together their own presentations and have kind of giveaways and materials to facilitate that. Um, about our gambling services, they are offered at no cost, as I mentioned, um, and they're offered in English and Spanish, but we will also obtain and pay for a translator for other languages that are needed at no cost to the person. Um, and you don't have to have a problem. I will say that most people who come to us uh, with regards to their gambling come to us when things have gotten really bad, when they're losing their home, when they're um, being um, subject to um, um, possible legal charges as a result of uh, seeking out funds for their gambling um, and they're facing divorce and we really absolutely want to intervene early and of course we're always going to work with people who are struggling with serious problems. Um, lately we've gotten more people come to us early on and say yeah I just realized maybe I need to do this differently and some people will work with us to develop a plan to gamble in a more controlled way and others will come to the conclusion that they need to quit and we'll help them either way whichever the goal is and we will as I mentioned before offer and pay for that program that will block online gambling on all their devices for an entire year and that will be at no cost to the participant. And then there is a program called Voluntary Self-Exclusion Program which allows somebody to sign up to be excluded from both casino gambling and sports wagering and um, that is offered through uh, the Illinois Gaming Board, so their offices, but also at the casinos, which is often um, maybe not the best place to go if you're trying to get help for gambling. So you can come to uh, one of our offices and we would be um, making sure that we can help you get signed up for this program and learn about the program before you sign up. Um, 
in a, in a safer environment. And I do want to open it up if anybody has resources that I didn't share. Now there's lots of resources, but if there's a resource that you want me to share, if you could throw it in the chat box and I will um, go ahead and tell everybody about that. And then also, if you think of something afterwards, you are welcome to email me and I'll make sure that I share that on future presentations. Um, my contact information, again, I'm Elizabeth Thielen. I can be contacted at gamblingservices at nicasa.org. That's a great email address because it also goes through to uh, the various team members on our team. So you're likely to get a much quicker response than if it just went to my really messy inbox. Um, but you also can call the main number at NACASA at 847-546-6450 um, just to learn about our services. If you want to set up a workshop that's remote, but it's specific for your group um, that we just want to have with your small group, whether it's a rotary, whether it's a school, whether it's a, um, some sort of service club, a business, it doesn't matter. We will meet with any interested group because this is a topic that um, affects all of us. And then there are some suggested readings for anybody who got really interested in this topic. Uh, the book that Dr. Adele wrote, she was the one in the uh, Today Show clip that I mentioned, or that we watched. And then Addiction by Design, which I had mentioned, uh, Natasha Scholl, she's a fascinating researcher. And then Why Can't I Stop? I love this book by Dr. John Grant. Um, because it really helps us to look at, you know, it's not one of those things where you could just say, just stop, just stop doing that, because it's not as simple as that, and it can help um, describe what people are struggling with and ways that they have gotten through that and come out on the other side. Again, um, my direct contact information is ethelin at nicasa.org, and I have a direct line of 847 2017099. And we can discuss potential referrals to our program, um, get resource cards. We have some resource cards in both English and Spanish. I'll get you a supply of them if you want to have them in your lobby or your business. Um, we can schedule a workshop. And then I want to close with these thoughts. Please be well. I talked about a lot of stuff. And as I mentioned, some of that stuff might hit close to home and it may not hit you now, it'll hit you on the way home or on another day and you just are you know, floored by it or affected by it. Please take care of yourself. If you do um, uh, know somebody who gambles, share this information with them. If you yourself gamble or you're thinking about gambling, um, consider those responsible gambling strategies. And um, we really hope everybody is well and we thank you for your time. And I am going to pause recording now so if there's any last minute question that you will have an opportunity